This is In Sickness and in Health. I'm Dr. Celine Gounder. In this episode, we're going to talk about topics that some parents may find unsuitable for young children. Parental discretion is advised. Like a switch went off one day and, and my child changed radically um, at age 11 or 12, right in there. But the early stages of life, Tons of friends in the neighborhood. Every kid played with Caden. So very outgoing. And the issue was the personality just changed at 11 or 12. And that's when all of a sudden we went from an extrovert to an introvert. And we could never figure it out, to be honest. It's, um, we, we tried. We just didn't get it. This is Ed Tully talking to me about his daughter, Caden. But once turning an introvert and changing kind of inward... Very limited in friends. Had friends, but it was just the one or two. It wasn't like large groups anymore. But anyways, played the sports, loved them, outgoing, super fast, super athletic, very good athlete. But then at age 12, pretty much quit everything. Um, I mean, at age 12, literally, we're talking door closed almost all the time. And then at middle school, that's when all the homework stuff fell apart. Grades were horrible. Ed and his wife, Linda, really struggled to help Caden. It was rough. I'll just say that. And we never did really find a solution uh, because, quite frankly, we never knew that what the real problem was and nobody else at the schools ever figured it out. Uh, Kate and I got in some really big fights. Um, she was getting really rebellious. Um, and I, I remember at one time having a sit-down talk with my daughter in the kitchen and got her in there, hey, we got to really talk about the school stuff. And I, I kind of got to the point where I said, if if you're me standing here in the future and you're – child is doing what you're doing, what do you say to him? What are you going to say to him? What would you do to help your child get through this? Um, it didn't work. My child, I still remember it. Um, sorry. My child uh, went into tears. Caden had a secret. It took her years to share that secret with her family. In this episode, we'll focus on one group of young Americans that's been in the news a lot lately, and that's at especially high risk for mental health issues like depression, anxiety, and suicide, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer youth. You'll hear the story of a family caught in the crosshairs of these issues, and from a doctor who's doing what she can to help trans teens be themselves. For a long time, we didn't know all that much about mental health and suicide among LGBTQ persons. Part of the problem was that sexual orientation and gender identity aren't reported on birth and death certificates or driver's and marriage licenses. But the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention does conduct a regular survey of risk behaviors in high school students, and they recently put questions about sexual orientation on the list. They found that LGBTQ high school students are at least twice as likely as their peers to be bullied threatened, assaulted, forced to have sex, or to feel sad or hopeless. And they're five times more likely to have attempted suicide. In fact, about a third of LGBTQ high school students report attempting suicide in the prior year. But these stats don't tell the whole story. I wish I had all the education I have today. To just go back a couple, three years, four years ago. Four years ago would have been great if I would have known what I know today, but that's not how it works in life, so you learn the hard way. Ed Tully is a businessman and a basketball coach who lives in Rockford, Minnesota, or Michelle Bachman territory, as he and his wife Linda call it. He's 55, five kids, four dogs. And a very close family, and that's what I care about. I would say I'm your average American family in the suburbs. And of course what makes us different is what we've kind of gone through with Caden. Ed is really close to his kids. Checking in was important to him as he was raising them, coaching them in sports, and helping them through difficult times in school and social situations. But his daughter, Caden, was different from his other kids. If my whole family, my in-laws and my friends all said, who was the quietest, most introverted child I have, it was Caden. This was just the way she was, and she was an introvert and going to be quiet. Ed says that growing up, 
Caden was unemotional, sardonic, and largely kept to herself. Her grades weren't great, but she made it through high school and then took some classes at the local community college. She got a part-time job. And for a little while, Ed and his wife thought that Caden was on track. But then things changed. She stopped going to school. She hid in her room. She slept all day. And she had a hard time keeping up at work. And grew out her hair, changed the style of clothing. She was not goth, but close to goth. It was, I, hate to say, I don't know how you would call it. I guess you'd call it anime in a way style, but she would order clothes from Japan, Hong Kong. They had a lot of black, a lot of chains and netting on it, big boots, black boots, um, got some makeup, and I figured it was a style. I didn't know it was trans, she was transgender by any means. I just figured it was a style. I won't lie, the long hair came out. I was a little embarrassed at first because um, I didn't quite know what was going on, and it seemed kind of radical. Um, and that went on for a few months, so her hair was way down, and I'll call down to the shoulder, but pretty close. Um, so I didn't know what was really going on, but the friends were the same. So Ed is really honest about how he felt every step of the way. Not just the stuff that makes him look good, but also about his ignorance, his confusion, and his missteps. In case you hadn't already guessed, Caden wasn't born Caden. She was born Tyler in a male body and raised as a boy. Ed told me it never occurred to him that his daughter was his daughter. Growing up, Caden liked girls. Ed thought he had a heterosexual son, not a lesbian daughter. It's just out of the blue. Uh, my wife was just kind of disappeared and went upstairs, and there she was in talking to Caden. And I don't know the whole conversation that went on there, but I just know that she told my wife that uh, she was a girl and had always been a girl since age 12. Caden was 20 when she came out to her mom, Linda. That's eight years of knowing she was a girl and keeping it mostly to herself. By the time she told her family, Caden had already started hormone treatment. She was in therapy at the University of Minnesota where she saw doctors who specialized in transgender care. And she had officially been diagnosed with gender dysphoria. I came in and shut the door and I basically said at the time it was Tyler's name, but hey, Tyler, let, let's talk for a minute. And I said, hey, mom just told me what's going on and said that um, you're actually a girl and I understand this transgender thing. And anyway, I sat there on the bed with her and I just said flat out 100%. I said, you know, I get this. This is, It explains a lot of things that have gone on in your life. And I'll, I just said flat out, I love you and um, I'll support you 100% and you just tell me what you need. And I don't think we said too much after that. It was kind of a short conversation. Uh, but I wanted to let her know I loved her, and I would do whatever I could to help her. And and then I left the room, actually, and just went down and talked to my wife and tell her I'd, what I had said to her, and that we're good, and, and just kind of said we got some things to learn now. Caden was fortunate to have the loving support of both her parents and access to doctors who specialize in trans care. Such doctors remain an all-too-short supply. Uh, my name is Jimena Lopez. Uh, that's spelled X-I-M-E-N-A, Lopez, and I'm a pediatric endocrinologist, and I'm an assistant professor at UT Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, Texas. Dr. Lopez started the first clinic for transgender youth in the state of Texas. The whole idea of a specific program for these kids is relatively new. The oldest, at Boston Children's Hospital, is only a decade old. But the demand is there. When Lopez opened her clinic a little over two years ago, she had around 50 patients. Now she has more than 400. Only five years ago, Dr. Lopez had never cared for a young transgender patient. And then came Evan, a nine-year-old who was born female, but who identified as a boy. He suffered from depression as a child but his mother gave him the freedom and the tools to be socially male. The name, the clothes, the haircut, and his depression lifted. But when puberty hit, Evan started to develop breasts. He was on the verge of presenting as a female, and suddenly the comfort he'd achieved in his identity as a boy started to slip away from him. So Evan's mother took him to see Dr. Lopez. She told me she had visited multiple pediatric endocrinologists and no one was willing to see or treat his kid. And she, she said, I don't 
mine if you're this is your first patient, but um, I will do anything I can for my child's mental health. Dr. Lopez happened to have trained to be a pediatric endocrinologist with the doctor who founded the first transgender adolescent program in Boston. So she already knew that transitioning, medical treatment to reassign gender, could be a necessary step for the psychological well-being of trans people. So Dr. Lopez sent Evan to a psychiatrist who confirmed that yes, Evan definitely had gender dysphoria, and that doctor recommended puberty suppression. And um, it was a very special patient because as a pediatric endocrinologist, I had never had that feeling of I'm helping somebody be who they know themselves to be, who they really are. And it was really gratifying. Uh, also, you know, as a pediatric provider, you also work a lot with the parents, not just the child. And the trust that that parent had with me and, and you know, how thankful she was was really special. Evan was just nine years old when he started treatment. And that may sound young, but just imagine you're a young boy and you start developing breasts or you get your period or you're a young girl and you're growing facial hair and your voice drops, your body would feel all wrong. Dr. Lopez says that most of her patients have depression or anxiety, much of which is related to their gender dysphoria. But stigma, discrimination, harassment, and family rejection also play an important role. Dr. Lopez estimates that about 40% of her patients have attempted suicide. In fact, she started a program for transgender youth to help prevent those patients from getting to that point. Once a patient is diagnosed with gender dysphoria, Dr. Lopez starts them on hormones to block puberty. Basically, it pauses the process and buys time. It's reversible, but the patient avoids the distress that comes with unwanted physical changes. They get psychological support and a game plan. Dr. Lopez says it doesn't really make sense for a prepubescent person to have gender-affirming surgery, but that puberty pause is a really important step because there are some things like broad masculine shoulders that surgery just can't undo. After the pause, cross-sex hormone therapy with either testosterone or estrogen allows someone to develop masculine or feminine features. I mean, what I, what I hear from my patients, because I always ask them, so why do you want, you know, testosterone or estrogen? Why? And the answer is normally because I'm a guy or I'm a girl and this is how I see myself. And the exciting you see from starting it or knowing they're going to start it is so amazing <laughs> that you realize this is, you know, they really, really want and need this. So Dr. Lopez plays a crucial step in peaceful transition for a lot of young people. Studies have shown that gender-affirming medical treatment relieves the psychological suffering many young trans people experience. But there's still a massive barrier for trans youth because these kids still have to be out in the world and there's often an inevitable public aspect to their process. Some people think that transgender people are sort of freak or perverted people that, you know, because before this became a hot topic, you know, many people thought a transgender person would be a like a drug queen or some... You know, we have preconceived notions of what we see in movies. Um, and part of it, I think, is the fact that uh, we know that when transgender people are not supported early on as, you know, young people as adolescents, many of them go into high-risk behaviors and run out of their houses, become homeless, don't go to school, don't have a job, end up getting to, you know, drug abuse, alcohol, prostitution in order to survive or get HIV, get STD, so this sort of bad route that uh, has to stigmatize this population. But the root of things is that it doesn't have to be that way if this kids are supported early on. Dr. Lopez says there's also a lack of understanding on the part of people who have never met, as far as they know, a transgender person. 
and many religious communities opposed the idea that someone could be a gender other than the one they were first designed at birth. But the most important thing, the step that could prevent a lot of this stigmatizing from happening in the first place, is for parents to totally accept and support their kids from the beginning. The really young kids, so like school-age kids before puberty, who are supported and understood by their parents, they are like doing fantastically. They don't have any mental health issues, most of them. They are just normal kids. The kids that come to us much later because they, you know, it took their parents a long time to to understand and support them. They're the ones that have much higher psychopathology. So I, I really think that if we support these kids early on, you know, the outcome is going to be so much better, and that stigma is also going to go away. Safe and welcoming school environments are also very important in combating stigma and reducing the risk of suicide. Researchers have found that being denied access to identity-appropriate bathrooms or campus housing at colleges and universities is associated with increased risk for suicidality. But many states have considered bathroom bills to restrict the use of public bathrooms on the basis of someone's birth sex. Transgender teens are now suing for their right to use the bathroom matching their gender identity. What's the big deal about bathrooms? Bathrooms matter because they're a litmus test for whether you really believe someone is the gender they say they are. And that acceptance is paramount. Just a month into his presidency, Donald Trump's administration rolled back Obama-era guidance to schools to let transgender students use whatever bathroom they want to use, the bathroom corresponding with their gender identity. The Obama administration had instructed schools to treat transgender students consistent with their gender identity or risk being in violation of anti-discrimination laws. Trump says that these guidelines were issued without the input of parents, students, and teachers or the input of the states and local school districts, which have the primary role in establishing education policy. The Trump administration's reversal doesn't stop individual states or schools from making their own guidelines, but it does make room for people across the country to question whether those rights are really rights at all, and to question the validity of a transgender identity. And that's created a lot of anxiety for transgender people and their families. Again, Dr. Lopez. And we've also seen that after something like this happens, there's sort of like a trend of more discrimination among those who, you know, already are sort of against transgender people and maybe kept it. And then it sort of flourishes when something like that happens. It sort of creates that environment. We also hear from kids being more bullied after something that happens. But yes, we also definitely get calls from them, from the parents saying they're more anxious. And we've actually had to email, you know, letters or send, you know, cards to our whole patient population when something like that happens, expressing our support, because we know it's, it's a harder time for them. Dr. Lopez's patients have a support system that a lot of trans kids don't get. It's something that Ed Tully, the Minnesota dad you heard from earlier this episode, tried to provide his daughter, Caden. But there was still the outside world, with the danger of judgment and harassment around every corner. Ed learned that lesson the hard way, the hardest way possible. Man, if I would have known all this in the beginning, what a different parent I could have been. And I know it's all hindsight. There's nothing I can do about it. It's, that's what happens. It's a hard learning thing because we have such low education about this um, out there and schools and other places just don't share this information. Because of that, there was a lot that Ed still didn't know once his daughter Caden had come out. And it wasn't like everything changed for her. She had started taking hormone treatment, but was still a female in a male body. And she wasn't even legally Caden. She was still Tyler Tully living in a community where she'd been known as boy a community that wasn't especially well-versed in the nuances of gender identity. 
It was when Caden finally took the step of changing her name and registering as a woman that Ed saw a shift in her. She filed all of the paperwork herself and went before a judge in Buffalo, Minnesota. So I, I was actually surprised by one thing. One, I knew the, the change in name was going to happen. I was cool with that. The judge allowed it. But what Caden filled out on the application was to also have a, the gender changed. And she had gotten letters from the psychologist and the therapist and the medication she was on to get labeled female. So the driver's license would be changed to female also. Um, so I was cool with it, but I was surprised. I didn't realize we were going that far um, in terms of that day. Even then... Ed hadn't fully internalized how important it was to Caden that the world recognize her as female. So we got breakfast, and luckily my daughter got up and went to a bathroom. I have to tell you this, but the waitress came over and saw that she had left the table, asked us what we'd like, and she said, do you know what your daughter wants, which is very cool. Um, so they were seeing her as a girl. But anyways, things were great. My daughter went home, went on Facebook, put out a big deal, like, my name has changed, I'm now Caden, I'm so happy. And literally, we thought, wow, this is like the first time I see my child smile again. Um, show emotion, really get out there with the friends. So we literally saw what I call turning for going the right way. Ed says he and his wife saw a happier kid. He encouraged her to go back to work, and she got a job at Walmart. For a couple months, things seemed better. As Ed saw it, Caden was getting what she needed. She was a young woman. Her driver's license said so. I do know there was a frustration when my wife changed medical insurance about a year before that because of all the great plans that we have out there today. I'm joking. And the coverage wasn't going to be the same. And I know my daughter, I could tell, was bummed when my wife talked about how we're changing insurances and she was like well this isn't going to be covered in this and then she tried to buy her own insurance through target but it was too expensive so i think she saw that as a delay to be converted you know for future surgeries i think my daughter just saw like i'm not going to get changed it's going to be years and i think she just gave up to be honest though doctors and scientists agree that transition related care is medically necessary Many health insurance plans don't cover cross-sex hormone therapy or gender-affirming surgery. Coverage varies by state. The average cost of transition-related care is about $30,000 to $45,000. That would be like paying for a back surgery or heart bypass surgery out of your own pocket. That's a lot for one family to bear. But it's not that much when you consider that gender dysphoria can be deadly. I'm going to blow the line here, but they say something like, Con- oh, what's the word I want? Not convert, but let's either switch or die. It's one or the other. And if you can't get switched, you might as well commit suicide. Throughout our conversation, Ed acknowledged the clarity of hindsight, the things that may have been warning signs. But he still describes the night that Caden died as completely unexpected. Out of the blue, we got down, to, I think it was October 26th, 25th. It was a Friday night of that weekend on 2013, and my kid said, God, it was fairly late at night, too. It might have just been 8 or 8.30, but said, hey, I'm going out. And I I still remember, I, I swear, all I said was, um, um, have a good time. We'll talk to you later. You know, and took my van and um, took off for the night. When Caden wasn't home by Saturday, Ed sent her a few text messages and assumed she was with a friend. When she wasn't home on Sunday, he started to get concerned. But Caden was 20, an adult, and she had disappeared for the weekend in the past. And unfortunately, it was Sunday night, and it was around 9 o'clock. My, I had Nick, Brennan, my wife and I were out in the family room watching a movie together, lights off, popcorn, the whole bit, kind of a family night get-together. And that's when the doorbell rang. It was around 9 o'clock, and I came over to the door, and I just peeked out the window, and I saw two Wright County Sheriff guys, and I saw two, at least one big truck, sheriff truck, and then another sheriff vehicle, um, anyways, in my driveway. And uh, they, I opened the door, and I just, I just kind of looked at them, and they go, hey, we got, I don't have the exact words, but something to like, um, can you tell us if Caden Tully lives here? And I said, yes, she does. And um, the one guy that was in the, more in the front said, do you mind if I come in? And, uh, and he came in the door, and that's when he said, I 
some to the effect of, I'm so sorry, but we found your daughter at Buffalo Lake, and she has committed suicide. Anyways, that just started a whole breakdown. I kind of think I went into a half breakdown and started crying. I went down the hallway. I don't remember how loud I was, but I was yelling at Linda that Cadence. I remember the words I used. Cadence died. He's committed suicide, something to that effect. And she's like, what? And kind of screaming. And kind of watched the whole family break down. In the aftermath, Edward learned that Caden had ordered a gun online just a few weeks prior. Caden even went to gun safety class to obtain a concealed carry permit. A friend of Caden's told Ed she'd gotten the gun to protect herself because she was transgender. Contacting friends and filtering through social media, Ed found evidence that Caden had talked about committing suicide with fellow online gamers. She posted on Facebook that she wished people would just get over things and just love each other. You know, I know, I know he was sick of it. You could tell by comments on his Facebook how he was just tired of it. He was tired of all the stuff out there in the, out in the, in the Internet world, I guess. Things are people saying, things he dealt with day to day when he was in his car, the way people looked at him. Uh, or her, I mean, sorry, he did it again. See, I always do this. It's really bad. So <laughs> keep saying he instead of she. Ed says that at Caden's funeral, people were confused. Many didn't know Caden was transgender, and most didn't know she'd died by suicide. A handful were clearly uncomfortable. Ed attributes that to the politically conservative area of Minnesota where they live, but he hadn't realized how in the dark he and his wife had also been until long after Caden's death. And uh, we were just oblivious parents, just like got the hair, growing boobs, getting there, got more therapy to go. We just didn't look into it. I didn't do my studies. I didn't do my research. It, it took suicide. And it didn't even take that. It, it took suicide, months and months of pain, reaching out to figure out, God, Linda, we got to go out. We got to talk to people. We got to get out of the house. We got to get through this. And I just happened to find P flag, went to a meeting or two. And next thing you know, as I'm digging into this, and then people ask me, like, would you like to speak? Then I had to get prepared for speaking, and then I started doing my research. And I'm like, holy crap, who, why, you know, I mean, I know it's out there, but it's, my God, I had no clue that, and I don't know what the exact number is, one-third that attempt or one-third that commits suicide, but it's up there. What became clear to Ed, only after grieving and rebuilding led him to do his research, was exactly how vital transitioning is to a transgender person. He says that he and his wife, Linda, thought they had years. The biggest mistake, he says, the one that may have been the difference between life and death for his daughter, was thinking that gender-affirming surgery could wait. If I could do it all again, I would have sold everything I had and got my child changed immediately. Ed knows he can't do it all over again. He said that to me over and over again. But what he can do, what he's committed his life to doing, is share what he knows now so that other kids and other parents don't have to have an experience like his. To counter the stigma and harassment, Ed Tully now spreads a message of welcome and support far and wide. He speaks at PFLAG meetings, that's parents, families, and friends of lesbians and gays, to local schools, and to a homeschooling group that encourages open discussion about gender identity. But facilitating that conversation, normalizing the subject, and making people comfortable with the idea, Ed says, starts at home. It starts with the parents of a transgender child. Here's my number one piece of advice for a parent, and I just gave this to a parent a week ago who called me to tell me their son just came out. Um, being gay and we were sitting at a brewery or whatever and was ta talking to her and, and she said what's the one thing if you had anything of advice being your son came out and you had a transgender and I said flat out you have to come out 100% you have to be out you have to be you can't have hesitation 
when your child comes out, you have to show it by to me, the way you prove you support your child 100% is you're willing to come out yourself 100%. That means you're willing to pop out and tell any friend you're out with, oh, by the way, my son's gay. Oh, he's got a partner. And you just do it. A lot of parents, and I did too for a while, I hesitated, especially with Caden, um, because you worry about what friends are going to say, what neighbors are going to say, and you hesitate. The, the problem is your, ch- your transgender gay child sees that, they read it, and they get you're not 100% in, and they'll know. They just know. Um, and that's what I felt I did with Caden. I held on way too long, um, hiding it. Um, there are comments I even made about when he was first going to work at Target about, you're not quite out, people don't know who you are, you might have to hide your breasts for a while, and to, you know things like that, which is wrong, completely wrong. I know there were some things I said that were completely wrong, and you have to be 100% out, and I'll be honest, if my son came out tomorrow, I would put it on Facebook. Whether it's surgery or the bathroom you use, Having the rest of the world see you as the gender you think you are is so fundamental to your sense of self, your self-worth, your self-confidence, and your self-determination. And that's why transgender teens are fighting for their right to use the bathroom that matches their gender identity. It's a battle for their health and safety and themselves. That fight continues at the federal, state, and local levels across the country. Between 2013 and 2016, at least 24 states considered bathroom bills. To date, only North Carolina successfully enacted restrictions to limit the use of bathrooms based on someone's birth sex. North Carolina's bathroom law was a response to legislation passed at an even more local level in Charlotte, North Carolina, that allowed transgender people to use bathrooms corresponding with their gender identity. North Carolina then faced boycotts by businesses, sports leagues, and musicians, losing money and jobs. The state finally bowed under that pressure and repealed its bathroom bill, but at the same time banned local governments in North Carolina from passing their own non-discrimination laws for the next three years, essentially punting the decision back to the federal courts. In our next episode, we'll talk about the adolescent microcosms that can cause feelings of depression and suicidal ideation. Stress and isolation often have a disproportionate effect on young people. We'll hear how young people get caught in these worlds and how to help them out. If someone you know is in crisis or thinking of hurting themselves, do not leave them alone. Remove any firearms, alcohol, drugs, or sharp objects that could be used in a suicide attempt. Take them to an emergency room or seek help from a medical or mental health professional. Call the U.S. National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800-273-TALK. That's 800-273-8255 or text the crisis text line at 741-741. Another resource for LGBTQ youth is the Trevor Project's Lifeline at 866-488-7386. If you like what you've heard and would like to learn more about this podcast, or if you'd like to support the making of more episodes of In Sickness and In Health, please check out our website, insicknessandinhealthpodcast.com. That's in sickness and in health podcast.com. And please don't forget to rate and review this podcast wherever you listen. Today's episode of In Sickness and in Health was produced by Hannah McCarthy and me. Our theme music is by Alan Vest. <laughs>